Hello and welcome back to another live from the Cambrian virtual show that we're going to be giving you between the 22nd of May and the 29th of May. Uh, we're super excited to be delivering these talks to you. Uh, this isn't the only talk that we're doing. We have previously done talks uh, and we've also got more coming up later on this week as well. Uh, you can see all of our previous talks and the talks coming up on our website which is cambrianphoto.co.uk. Um, through there, you can click on the Photo and Optics show and see all the speakers that have been and coming up as well. Alternatively, there is a link in the description as well, and also a link that I'm just about to post into the comments. So you can follow either of those links and you can see uh, who's been and who's coming up on our show. Uh, we're also happy to announce as well that uh, all of our talks that we're going to be doing are available for free on both our YouTube page and our Facebook page. Um, because we're offering these for free, we are asking for donations, which will be going to chosen charities and also local food banks as well. The link to donate is also on our speakers page uh, on our website. Uh, thank you very much. Um, had a wonderful uh, sort of talk uh, today so far and uh, now is a wonderful time to uh, welcome Justin who's going to be talking a little bit about the digiscoping as well so uh, let's all give a uh, big welcome to Justin Carr. Hi Justin how's it going? Hi there great thanks. Great. Jolly good jolly good. I see you I see you're already there set up with uh, with, your, with yeah. your scope and your camera attached in the background there. Yeah, yeah, all ready it's, to go, all ready to go. And it is, is, that your, is that your sort of kit that you, you would use out on the field? Yeah, generally, generally. I have, I have got um, lenses, you know, normal lenses as well. But generally, most, most of my photography that I do is taken through, through the scope sort of thing. So Brilliant. I like yeah. to see you've got some pictures up in the background there as well. Are these some of the, the pictures yeah. that you've taken as well? Yeah, there's, there's some, of, some of mine. Yeah. So it's, so, it's always nice to see your own pictures up, up on the on your own wall. It certainly is, isn't it? And knowing yeah. that you've you've taken it and uh, it, it brings you back to that memory of, of when you actually took the picture as well, doesn't it? Which is yeah. So, yeah. such a lovely, uh, such a lovely thing. Uh, yep, comments are coming in. Uh, Please let us know if you are watching live. Uh, we've got uh, quite a few people watching. Uh, say hello. Let us know that you're actually there watching live. That's always nice to yeah, know that in. people are watching. Yeah. Uh, also, as well, uh, any questions that you're going to have regarding digiscoping uh, throughout this presentation, uh, just drop them into the comments, and we will uh, try to get them at any natural stops, or we'll just let them build them up at the end and get to them then. <laughs> But uh, we'll see how we go. Uh, Justin, you've got a little presentation ready for us, I believe. That's right. Um, yeah, I'd just like to explain my my take on digiscoping, what what I do, um, and just maybe pass a little bit of knowledge on to, to people watching. So, yeah, that's brilliant. So, should we uh, should we make a start? I uh, yeah, let's let's crack on. Right. So, first of all, we'll talk about the equipment. Now, I use the Swarovski brand. I use um, a Swarovski STX 85. That's the scope. And the, the S is straight. Uh, I find it much easier using a, a straight scope than, a, than an angled. Um, just makes it much easier to get, to, to get on your subject, especially, especially birds in flight. Um, you know, I do a lot of... A lot of a uh, lot of birds in flight, so I just find it much easier um, to get on the subject with it being a straight scope. Um, so the adapter is, I'll just take it off and show you, is a TLS Apo, right? Now that's Swarovski's own adapter. It's basically, just take it off and show you, right? If you can see there, it's actually a lens, a lens in, in it, so you can actually use it. Turn the camera on and use it as a as a 23 mil lens. 
Now, there's three, there's three different um, TLS APO adapters, each for different types of camera. Um, 23 mil is for micro thir four thirds body, which I use a Panasonic Lumix GH5. Um, to do them for the crop sensor, uh, crop sensor uh, cameras, um, they're a 30 mil, um, 30 mil uh, lens inside. And they do them for full frame cameras as well. And the full frame camera the lens in the inside in, on the inside, that's a 43 mil. So for each different camera you've got, you've always got the right adapter for it. So pop that back on. Right, so also I've got the uh, professional tripod and tripod head from Swarovski and also the balancing rail. Now the balancing rail is really important. Um, if, you, if it's not balanced, if it's got a heavy camera on the back and it's not balanced, it's just going to drop way, one way or the other. So with the balancing rail, you can move it along so you get exactly exactly balanced you can see and that's really it just makes it a lot easier a lot easier and also it's really important to try and get your tripod level um some have spirit levels um some don't but if you just use your eye get down get down and just look at the a part of the tripod and just guess just guess but if you if you don't if you're if you're scanning and you've got it, you've got it locked, locked on, and your tripod's not level. And you're scanning; it's going to go down. And also the horizon as well. If you if you've got the horizon in in your image, it's going to look you know, lopsided. So it's really important to, to get your tripod 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 as level as possible. I'd say. So, right, that's that's that. Right, we'll go into. Um, settings. That's probably easier if I just take take the camera off. Right. So with the settings, I always shoot in. Now where is it? In aperture priority when I'm shooting, and I'm also on the other side in burst mode as well. Now. Aperture priority. This ca this camera with this um, with this Apo fitted, it's a fixed aperture of round about f8. Now you can only change the shutter speed by ch changing the ISO. And you will, if you have it in aperture priority, you'd always always have it set in the camera. At, you know it's, it's set anyway. But the only way of, of changing the, the shutter speed is using the, the ISO button um, to get the shutter speed you need. Um, so yeah, you want it in burst mode as well because you don't want just one shot. You could miss that, you know, you could miss that that important image. So these cameras shoot around about 10, 10 frames per second. Um, but some, some more modern cameras um, shoot more. You can, you can get more than 10 frames per second if you go into 4K um, burst mode, um, we'll come on to that a bit later on. But I tend to, I tend to set you see what, what it is as well. Just, this is the most important thing about digiscoping. It's, it's all manual focus. So when you get on your subject, you're, you're with this hand on the, on the uh, on the trigger button, and then you're focusing with the focus wheel on the on the telescope. And it's really most the most important thing about digiscoping is you've got to get in focus, properly in focus. If not, you, you're not going to get a sharp a sharp image. So what I'll what I'll say is there's there's aids. On mirrorless cameras, which help you focus on the image. Now, one is focus peaking, 
I mean, what, what it does is it detects, um, detects contrast and it knows when you, what it does, it puts a halo, a halo around your image. And when it's in focus, it's like a digital halo. You'll see this halo. I've got mine set to blue. Uh, there's three different colors you can have, green, blue, and white. I don't tend to have it set into green because obviously there's a lot of green in trees. Um, and you don't want it, you want to be able to see. So in, with blue, not a lot of blues in nature, not as much, not as, much as green. So I tend to have it set in, set in green. But what I'll do is I'll, sh I'll show you, I'll show you how to uh, get into focus peaking in, in the menu system. Right. So how can we do this now? Let's have a look. Right. So we'll go into menu. That's a bit difficult. I'll just I'll just tell you. It's probably it's probably easier to, to tell you. Into the menu, and you go down to into. That there, that custom, yeah, and then you go down to monitor, monitor and display. You click on that, and then you go down. See where it says peaking. So I've got peaking set to set to on, right. Sorry about that. Let me, just, let me just turn the phone off. Excuse me, it won't be a sec. And I think as well, Justin, what, I will, what we'll say there as well is that if anyone wants to know how to get their focus peaking on their camera, uh, you can either just message messages and we can sort of take you through a, a step by step sort of uh, thing to uh, to talk you through how to do sort of focusing uh, and focus peaking and things like that. So uh, or just list in the comments what camera you have and uh, we can get back to you that way. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, just, just show you here now. Right. So it'll, it says peaking. It's, it's on. Right, but when you go down to set, you can set it at the level. Now, you can see it. Now, what's what's funny about the Panasonics is, um, on the Panasonic, if you set it to high, there's low and high. If you set it to high, you don't get a lot of peaking, so it doesn't detect a lot of contrast. So you're better off setting it to low. And that way, it gives you more of a, a more of a halo round round your, your subject. So, if you look down below it as well, you can see set the color. And you can see I've currently got it set that's set there at blue. Yeah, so that's that's how you you get onto peaking. Um, it's also focus assist. Right now, what focus assist does? It crops in to a part of the image, um, and now you can you can magnify. You can magnify, like say, if you're on on the eye of a bird, you can magnify it through your viewfinder or on screen. So you can fine adjust the focus, and that's that's really useful if you've got a subject that's that's not moving very quickly, uh, or obviously with a bird that's flying. It's, it's no no use at all. But if you've got something static um, you want to focus on, or it's not moving very quick, focus assist is a great way of fine focusing on your subject. So I'll just run quickly through how you get onto that. Right, so... That's the same. And you go up to you go up to focus 
and release. And then you find manual focus assist and just click on, click on it. And that, that will, on mine, I've got function three button, F3, where is it? Just there, FN3 button. So when I press that, when I'm looking through the viewfinder, because I always use the viewfinder, I never use, I never use the screen when I'm out in the field. It's just a no-no with a, you know, with a light. So I always, I always use, use the viewfinder. So if I press the function three button while I'm viewing through the viewfinder, it magnifies an area, and you can move that area around wherever, you know, you, you want it to, to find focus on that certain area. So with focus assist and focus peaking, it makes the manual focus much easier. This is. This is something that's only been around for a few years, but most mirrorless cameras, which this is, uh, Sony, Sony has uh, a good range of um, mirrorless cameras, and they have uh, focus peaking and focus assist on a lot of their cameras. That's why digiscopers like to use them. It just, you know, mirrorless cameras are just a lot more convenient to use than. Um, you know, cameras, you know, like APS-Cs or full frames. You can use them, but the benefits to, to having these focusing, focusing aids, you know, are, are really, you know, are really useful. Uh, and also the, the downside of using uh, using a, a full frame or an APS-C, you, you can get sometimes shutter slap. So with the great focal length you've got, with a long focal length you've got through a telescope, which equates to, it starts at around about a thousand millimeters, yeah, um, and then it, you've got the zoom on it as well. You can zoom right up, and <clears throat> you'll, you'll get over two thousand milli equivalent of two thousand millimeters of of range for your uh, for your camera and for your scope. So it's just like it's just like using a, a long lens. The only disadvantage is you've got manual focus, but with these aids. It makes it so much easier to get sharp images. It does take practice, though. It does take some practice. I'll just say that. And I've been doing it for probably 20 years now, digiscoping. And before the peaking um, and the focus assist, you know, it was more tricky to, to get uh, a sharp image. But what I tend to do is I tend to take lots and lots of of images you know some, sometimes i might be if you can just see that, that gannet there i took that at benton a few years ago um just coming in just coming into land now i probably took over two thousand images that day to get that shot and that shot is the shot i've got in my, in my mind because the, the birds were flying in so with the focusing aids, I could see as it came in, focus the scope. When I could see the peaking, I had fire. But there were lots of misses before I got hit. So, so that's you know that's the good thing. That's the good thing about mirrorless cameras. The these these aids, and I can't emphasize enough how useful they are as a you know to get a good image. So, I tend to shoot in raw it just gives me more scope um when i'm when i'm editing my images in post um i, I used to shoot just, just jpeg um but since since shooting in raw i've i took some images which have been massively underexposed overexposed and when you shoot in raw it, you can you can bring them back you can bring them back into uh you know, with some sort of, it doesn't always work, but um, yeah, it, it does. It does help shooting in RAW. Um, I tend to, um, I use a shutter release as well in conditions like in, in winter in this country. The lights never, it's never great. 
um, when it when it's a dull day. Um, so you're best off with it with it having such a long uh, focal range. Using a I use a cable shutter release. They're only about you know only a few few pounds to buy. Um, I've used the digital the uh, wireless ones before, um, but I just find the wired the wired ones do do just 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 the job really. Um, so let's go on to the next next image, please. Right. So a little bit about the technique now. Um, both both these shots were taken with different lighting conditions. The one, the one on the left, the black-headed gull, I was at local park. I've just seen these black-headed gulls. And there's there's a story behind the story behind most most of my images that I take. And the story behind this is this this black-headed gull was on some water um above a small weir. So what I did was I placed myself at the at the foot of the weir. So I was on the level level with the with the bird. But the bird was in shadow. Right now it makes a, a really nice image because you've got the, the dark background which which wasn't as dark actually through the camera but in post I brought the shadows down which blackened the, the background out. Uh, and then also because I'm on the same level level as the bird, you know, it just makes I try and get as low as possible. If if I've got a bird on the ground and you're looking down at it, there's nothing there's nothing worse just looking down on a bird and, and you know so I try and get the tripod as low as as low as possible to, to the bird. It just makes for a more pleasing a pleasing image, I think. Um, so, basically, with the lighting, lighting is really important. Um, you know, if we didn't have any light, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have an image. So, but a lot of people just think, you know, you've got to have the sun behind you, you've got to have it you know, over your shoulder. Not necessarily. If you look at the the bird on the right, the bearded tit, it's it's lit from the from the side. Um, and also backlighting. So whatever light you've got, um, you know, you can always make an image from it. And I tend to, I tend to, when I'm in the field, I tend to look at, look at my subjects and think, yeah, I can do this because the light's coming from that direction. And I have a, an idea in my head um, what I want to do with that image. But I will just say I'm not a I'm not an expert I'm not an expert on on photography I don't claim to be an expert on knowing how, how cameras work I just do what I need to do um, to get to get the shot I want so there's there's people out there that that know a lot more about how, you know how cameras work than what I do but the best way the best way of learning as I've done is go to friends and and ask friends. You know, glean information off of people, and that's how you learn. That's how I've learned, and I pass my information on to other people. See friends, friends of mine. You know, they're they're improve improving leaps and bounds. I've got friends out there now that I've thought that that can get shots, bird of you know, shots of birds in flight turns, which are really difficult because they you know fly so fast. So it's just learning from other people. Learning from other people, really. So, next slide, please. So, this is another another one of that same that same goal. You can see it looks like I'm really low down, but I wasn't because I've got a brick wall, a brick wall with the the area of water behind it, and then I was just stood up to my ankles in water as water was coming over this weir. But that's what we do for shots, isn't it? Yeah. I can remember once wading wading through a uh, uh, what I thought was a dry a dry mud bed of a stream and getting up to my ankles in it where I got the shot I wanted. So so yeah, getting more creative using using the light. Now this was taken at a Gillymox, taken on the Farn Islands. Now the farms, I don't know if any any of you have been to the farms. It's a fantastic place for for photographing seabirds. 
you literally have got thousands and the within a few feet some of some of them even run you know run through run between your legs you've got puffins you know a few feet away um so i just wanted on this trip to the to the farms i wanted to pick and get more creative with my photos so i picked you know this one i could see the glistening water behind it the spangled water in the sunlight I just thought it made a nice, um, it's a nice image because what um, what digiscoping does is when you when you take an image, the depth of field because of the great focal length is really shallow, so it's it's a plus in most points to me um, because it's always nice to have a background out of focus, a nice bokeh. Um, on the downside, if you've got something, um, a bird that's really close at minimum focus, because the, the scope will focus round it, down to around about 12 feet. So if you've got something round about 12 feet, like a bird sat on a branch, if it's not side on, if it's more skewed to one side, if you're focused on its on its eye, which you know most of the you know you will try most of the time to focus on the eye of the, of the bird tail might be out of focus if it's moved to one side so that's that's the downside of having um a really shallow depth of field but i like to use that shallow depth of field to get creative with my images uh next image please so this is another one another one of the guillemot and i just thought this would make a really nice black and white shot um i knew as soon as i took it uh, black and white and with it being a, a bridal guillemot with the with the rings around the eye it just made it a little bit more special that it's a bridal guillemot a little bit more to the to the image but i just really like the com composition of it as well so next image please this one as well a few i've just tried to strike a balance between um in everything you know like a, a balance a balanced image um and also at the bottom as well i think there's another bird if you look right at the very bottom where it looks slightly blurred that was another bird just getting in front which it doesn't really spoil it it's so sort of, i think it quite make, makes it makes it look better actually but now like i say just experiment experiment but what you have to do is you have to get used to using your camera first, used to the focusing, uh, used to using, knowing what ISO to use. So you can, you, you would, a bird like this, it's in bright sunlight. You probably wouldn't need much more than one five hundredth of a second. But if you're trying to get a photograph of a, uh, a guillemot in flight, that five hundredth of a second is not going to be, not going to be enough. You're going to need, something above uh 1600 of a second probably more for something like a, a guillemot um so you would need you know probably two thousandth of a second so what you would do is you would up your iso till you got that relevant shutter speed you need so that's the main thing i use the iso but all, obviously you've got to remember that the higher the iso the more noise you get you get with it so you've got to be you've got to balance it out you've got to balance it out really and pray pray that you have a a nice sunny day and then you don't you don't need to you don't need to crank your eyes up quite as much so next next one please right so now what we're going to look at is video right now i'm not an expert i'm not an expert by any stretch of imagination on video i just tinker tinker about with it and you can get some really nice video a lot of these cameras these days tend to be tend to be hybrid hybrid cameras the gh5 especially is um really well known for um for video probably used more for video than what stills so this is just a little bit of a, a video taken through taken through the scope that I've got. Now if you look you can see all the detail. 
all the detail in the feathers. Now this bird was probably about 20 feet away. So you can see, you can see the, the quality that you're getting through the, the optics, the scope. And the scope is the most important thing really, because you need a good quality. It's like, it's like having a, a cheap lens, cheap lens on a camera. It, you're better off having a, in my opinion, you're better off having a, a cheap camera, but spend more on the lens. Well, it's exactly the same, exactly the same with, with digiscoping. Your, your scope is the lens, so you're better off um, with quality brand like, like Swarovski, which it, it does make all the difference to the, to the image. Um, one thing, one thing that I would say um, with video, with, well, well, we'll say with still with stills. I try not to. We've got a zoom, and it goes from twenty-five to sixty. But obviously, you start zooming zooming in on the scope. Yes, you're getting more magnification, but you're losing light. And if you lose light, you lose shutter speed. You also lose definition. So when I'm when I'm taking stills, I try not to zoom the scope in. I just Tend to leave it, and then I would crop afterwards in post. That's how I do it with stills. But with video, you can zoom in a lot further uh, with video, and you don't tend to notice as much of a um, degradation in in the in the image. I don't know why. I can't, I can't explain why, but that's just how it looks. How it looks to me. So I do use the zoom regularly. When I'm when I'm using video, and you have have got um, a built-in zoom as well uh, into the camera, which is a digital zoom, and you can you can times it as times two and a times four if you've got anything that's that's really distant. I don't tend to use the times four because it just really does tend to break up a lot. But I do have. Uh, I do use the the times two digital zoom, and there's a, there's an also an optical zoom as well, which um, which gives a little bit more reach. And I, I always have it set on this optical zoom. That's always unless something's really really close, and you just want to fill the screen. But generally, if I'm if I'm videoing if I'm videoing a uh, subject, it's because I'm not close enough to get a good stills image. So the video then, you know, I, I tend to, like the other day, I was photographing a, a, a rare wader and it was probably 60, 70 metres away. Now that sort of distance, taking stills, you get a record shot. But the video, we took some video of it and the video was quite respectable. And also what you can do is as well, um, you can get a 4K still off the video. So if you if you're going through your video and you see, let's just say, you've got a bird and one of its identification features is when it lifts its wing, it's got a bar under its wing. Um, what you can do is when it lifts its wing on the video, you can pause it on that single frame and then save that as an eight megapixel image. And then what you can do, it's, it's actually just a JPEG, it's not raw, but what you can do is then you can um, import it. I use Lightroom, and you can edit it as you would a normal a normal image. So it's it's worth bearing in mind that you know if I like to get close as close as possible to a subject without causing any disturbance, because that's the main thing. You can, you you can't cause a bird any disturbance or or any animal any disturbance. It's just it's just not good field craft it's not it's not good so you know i tend to that's the good thing about digiscoping we are having a long focal length you don't have to get as close as what you would with with you know with other lenses so yeah we'll go into a gallery onto the gallery all right next next one please so peregrine falcons Really fast flying birds. 
and as I said, as I said earlier, the focus peaking allows you to when birds in flight, you can get on a bird in flight. It takes some practice to actually to actually get on on the bird in, in flight anyway because of the long focal length. So it does take some practice to actually get on and then focus and stay on the bird. But it does make it possible to get images like this of a, of a peregrine falcon with, with peaking. But the focus assist, like I explained, wouldn't work because if you're if you're focusing on you know on the eye eye of that that bird, you're just gonna you're just gonna lose lose that bird as it's as it's as it's flying through. So you can only re really use the focus peaking. Um, it really it just takes pra it just takes practice. Digiscoping is not something you could just pick up, and you're not going to get absolutely stunning results straight away. I can't emphasise as much. You, you need to, you need to practice at it, but don't give up. Um, I, I know a lot of people I talk to. Um, I do shows for Swarovski. I do bird fair and various various shows, giving advice on on uh, on, on digiscoping. And a lot of people you talk to say, I started off digiscoping, but I just give it up because I couldn't do it. Now that was probably in the days when they had, didn't have the focusing aids on the cameras. It's a lot different now, and if you can persevere and practice, then you can get shots of peregrine falcons. So next, next slide, please. Now, this is one of my favourite shots purely because of the composition. So you've got the male bearded tit and the female bearded tit, and to get them both together in shot and also looking at you they're both in the same plane of uh depth of field so if that female was or if that male was a little bit closer the female would have been out of focus so to get everything i've got the light so you've got the glint in the eye i do like to get the glint in the eye with with my images i'm not one for putting put, putting the glint in the eye with post process I just don't. I don't do it. Some people do. That's fine. That's fine. But just me. No, I like to have the glint in the eye naturally. So I just like the composition of this image, um, and it, you need to get both the male and the female in at the same time. So next image, please. And just a lesson on red poles. Uh, if anybody uh, interested, that's an Arctic red pole the one on the left. Now, I've just put this image in because I just quite, quite liked it, but these two birds were really close. Uh, there were a crowd of people around them. They just weren't bothered. They come in, they come in in the autumn, and like a lot of birds that, that come into the country in the autumn, they're hungry, so they become really quite tame and unaware of people around them. So... These weren't much further away than minimum folks. I'd say they were probably 15 feet away and they just weren't bothered at all. So the, the closer you can get, it's like conventional photography, the closer you can get to an image, the more detail you can get. It's like if, if, them, if them birds were 50, 60 meters away, you wouldn't see the detail in the plumage as much. You wouldn't see the, the fine feather detail. And that's the advantage of getting as close as possible without disturbing. Um, you know, you can see more detail in the bird. Next slide, please. I can go back back again. That's it. Now, there's always there's always ways of getting some shots. Um, now, this as I, well, what I mean is some shots are set up now. This is wild cuckoo. Um, its its name is Colin. One of my friends nicknamed it Colin. It's been I think it's returned now uh, to Surrey. It's on a heath in Surrey. It's returned for about five years now. And this bird is they put food down for it. So and they put they put um, perches out for it. So it makes it a really easy subject. Now cuckoos generally. Are not easy birds to get close, but this thing, you know, 
minimum focus, minimum focus at times. It's so what what I'm saying is use hides. Yeah. Use public hides, you know, where you can get close to the bird, you're not you're not disturbing it. You know, no disturbing this bird because it, it you know it was there for food and you knew why you were there. You know, once you knew you got food for it. So use hides, whether it's public hides on nature reserves or your own little hide. Um but and you know, use it's not it's not bad to get set up shots. No, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but every now and again, you know, it's okay. Generally, when I go out bird watching, because that's what I do, I'm 50% bird watcher and 50% photographer. Um, I'll go out for a day's bird watching and I'll generally just photograph what I see, what I see when I'm out, and to just take advantage of what's what's around me. It's occasionally I'll have things planned. This was one of them days for the cuckoo. Um the day on the day on the Farn Islands, that was a day that was planned. But no, just enjoy, get out there with your camera and your, your scope. Now, for, the, for everyone that's got scopes, you know, most people have cameras these days, whether it's, you know, an SLR. So why don't you use your SLR or your micro four thirds or your full frame camera or even your phone? Because that's another thing you can do. There's plenty of adapters out there now, and Swarovski do one as well. Um, let me just let me just get it. All right, so can we full screen, please? So you can see this is a VPA variable phone adapter. Yeah. Now most it will take most phones, and you can even swap this. To fit on a pair of Swarovski binoculars, but this is this is the ring currently for for the uh, scope that I've got. Now, generally, I don't do a lot of, of phone scoping, but it's it's there if I need it. Um, now, everyone's got a phone. Now, if you've got a scope and you're not you're not wanting to get into digi scoping big time and spend fifteen hundred pounds on a on a camera. That's possibly a way to start out digiscoping. And if you like it, then you can always move up to a up to a, a better camera. But you can get some quite good results with, with the phone, but ultimately the the camera, you will get a better image with a dedicated camera. So I'll just touch on that anyway. But the, there's a lot of phone phone scoping adapters out there now, but uh, that's the one I use anyway. So back on to images, please. Yeah, so another another bird in flight, which which was, you know, the beneficial to have the focus peaking is hen harrier. Now we don't see a lot of hen harriers these days. You know, they're being persecuted, being persecuted all over the place. So, you know, they're becoming quite a rare bird. So to see to see one locally. To where I live, yeah, I had to go out and see if I could get some shots of it. So, no story behind that one. Just a nice, a nice image, I think. Next one, please. Now, um, doing dragonflies is not easy because they don't tend to stay in one place for very long. Now, various dragonflies do hover. Now, this is a migrant hawker, I do believe. And migrant hawkers do have a habit of, of hovering in one place for a number of seconds. Uh, a lot of other, other dra dragonflies don't. They will not. They will not stay still, or they very, very rarely st stay still. But for migrant hawkers, it does make it possible to get a digiscope shot. You've got to be quick. You've got to be quick and actually be able to find to find it through the scope. And then to focus on it because normally you've probably got no more than 10 seconds before it's moved and gone. Um, and this is where focus peaking once again really comes in useful because you can see the haze, you can see the purple, blue round round the image. So as soon as you see that finger on the uh, trigger button, and this you would need a a really high shutter speed to freeze them wings. You're talking. 
probably four thousandth of a second. I can't remember exactly what what uh, the shutter speed was that I had it, had it at, but you need, I needed to really knock the ISO up. Even though it was a relatively bright day, I did need that high shutter speed to freeze the wings. So quite a yeah, quite a nice shot. Next one, please. Now there's a li little story behind this this one. These marbled whites. We've got um, we've got a small nature reserve near where I live in Doncaster in Yorkshire, um, Brockerdale. Now it's it's really good for butterflies in the summer, and one of its specialities is mar marbled white. Um, I've gone there this this day, you know, hoping to, hoping to photograph the marbled white, and after watching after watching them a while. I realized that um, there were more butterflies than what there were food flowers that they were, they were actually on. Um, so what they were doing is, if a butterfly was on a flower, it was really territorial over that, over that flower. But the other butterflies um, around it were, would constantly harass to try and get that butterfly off to claim claim that flower so what i did was i thought hmm there's a shot there so what i did i lowered the scope as low as possible i focused on on the flower i've got my shutter release cable in in my hand i've made sure i'd set an iso high enough to give me a shutter speed of at least two thousandth of a second probably two thousand five hundred of a second uh, and then I just waited. I waited with my finger, finger on the on the shutter release, and within a few minutes, uh, another marbled white cave came in and dive bombed that one that were on the flower, and it did it about five or six times. Um, it didn't win. You know, the 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 one that was on the flower stayed there, but I got this nice image of this marbled white attacking this other one. Doesn't look like it's attacking it, but that's primarily what it, what it was doing um so it looks it, uh, a lot of people have said to me how have you got an image did you scope like that but it was it was relatively easy just lucky at the time that i did manage to, to get one that was you know in the same depth of field as the as the one that was on on the flower so it's it's look it's look as well look at the draw sometimes so Next image. All right, this is this is my my last image. It's probably one of my, one of my favourites. And the story behind this is um, on the A1 um, near near Cambridge. There's a, an old lady. Um, she feeds the red kites uh, in a garden. Now. She does it round about two o'clock every afternoon. So if you're ever driving down the down the A1 or up the A1 around at that time in the afternoon, and you see twenty odd red kites flying around just at the side of the A1, it's probably this lady's garden. And this this is where I went to photograph red kites. Now the most I've seen round flying around the garden probably about thirty, but it gives you a good a good range of um, subjects, you've got 30 red kites um, flying around. Well, this bird was giving chase to another red kite, and that's why it's you know banked over. That's why it's you know it's calling. It was just giving chase, and I just really like the composition, the composition of it, and you know satisfying that all the wing, all the wing tips, all the all the feathers were 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 sharp. So yeah, just. Yeah, yeah, it's one of my favourite images. So, yeah, I think that I think that's it. If we can have a look through now, at some of the some of the questions, if that's okay. Yeah, no, that's so that's brilliant. Uh, yeah, your your inspiration into what you do is is absolutely phenomenal. The uh, the dedication to you know what you do is 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 truly amazing. <laughs> Thank you. So let's let's have a look now. Some of the yeah, so I've, I've had some comments through just uh, on uh, yeah. on my on email and phone as well, um, and also it was something that I was going to ask as well. 
Um, when I've used scopes in the past, they've always been angled. Yeah. Um, I've noticed in the background there you've got a, a straight one. A, a what? Sorry. A, a straight scope rather than an straight, angle. Straight scope. Yeah. Yeah. It just like I said earlier, it just makes it. If you're if you're viewing a subject, um, let let's just say a red kite in flight. If you've got an angle scope, you're looking down at it. It's much harder to um get on that bird if, he, if he's looking down but if you're looking like a conventional lens now you know you look at it, you see a red kite straight in front of you you point you know you focus shoot so yeah got it it just makes it a lot easier a lot easier to get onto your onto your subject sort of thing so no that's brilliant and um we we've, we've had a question which i think i've referred back to just uh on on our email because it'll just be a dedicated thing but uh i believe you can get adapters for any camera can't you yeah most so most can... cameras most cameras yeah yeah, yeah. so it's um, just finding out like the combination of adapters and stuff isn't it to get it going yeah, i can say i can see a question there from uh, fiona uh she's saying can i get an adapter uh for an xt2 um now i believe i believe the xt2 is a crop sensor uh crop sensor camera so you yeah. you would you would you could use depending on what scope you've got because this adapter only fits swarovski scopes so if you've got yeah. swarovski scope you can use this adapter um but what you would need is you'd need the 30 mil adapter and then the t2 mount so i'll just take this off and Right, so we'll get there. Yeah. Right. So that that's your adapter, right? That that's on the on the camera now is a T two mount. So what you would need you need a two the T two mount for your XT two. Now they're not a lot a lot of money. You can buy them for for a few pounds. So that's that's all you would need. But instead of Using the 23 mil, you would need the 30 mil adapter. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, I believe it does. That's brilliant. Oh, that's uh, that's wonderful. We've had a load of uh, load of nice comments coming coming through. So uh, excellent talk, Justin. Thank you there. Uh, we've also had uh, wonderful work, Justin. Thank you very much for sharing. Cheers, Jerry. Brothers. <laughs> That's that's brilliant. Um, yes, uh, lovely to have you here, Justin. Uh, it's been an yeah, absolute pleasure and sharing how uh, we can get to these uh, beautiful wildlife shots uh, just from uh, just from using uh, a scope as well. So absolutely brilliant. Uh, everyone that's watching live, you can give uh, a nice big thank you to Justin for coming here today. It's been wonderful. Cheers, having thanks you. for watching. Much much appreciated. I hope I hope have inspired to get out there and you've got you've got a camera you've got a phone just try some digiscoping just get out there and get shooting yeah that's it that's it that's brilliant i'll i'll speak to you just uh, after the live stream justin so hang on there for a second thank you okay. very much for joining us thanks for joining me everybody cheers absolutely brilliant um it's uh, it's a it's a great way of of alternatively getting sort of those uh, those wildlife shots, and as Justin said, a real good gateway. If you're already uh, into your wildlife, so you have a spotting scope. Um, most of us have phones, so you're able to adapt them uh, to actually start taking pictures straight away. So an absolute wonderful way of getting into the photography side if you're already into the uh, spotting of the wildlife absolutely brilliant um that is it for the talks today um we may have an unplanned uh, go live with me and joel sort of later on today which will just be a catch up on everything previous that's gone on uh, and also a update on our headline speaker as well which will be coming up so um Hopefully we'll be doing that later on. Uh, if not, we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, thank you for everyone watching live. It's always a pleasure to have everyone watching live and commenting, uh, it's brilliant. If you're re-watching this, so uh, 
you can rewatch any of our videos that we've done. If you're rewatching, make sure you can still comment, you can still ask questions, we can still get to them, that's not a problem. And also, if you could share the video, if you're watching on YouTube, please make sure that you subscribe to our channel as well. Thank you very much for now, and we'll see you later on. Bye-bye.